For our final talk of the day, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Laura Ogden. Laura A. Ogden is an environmental anthropologist at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. Her work explores the politics of environmental change and, con change and conservation, contributing to theoretical discussions in political ecology and environmental anthropology. She has conducted ethnographic research in the Florida Everglades with urban communities in the United States and is currently working on a long-term project in Tierra del Fuego, Chile. Her books include Swamp Life, People, Gators, and Mangroves, Entangled in the Everglades, published in 2011, and Loss and Wonder at the World's End, published in 2021. She has served as president of the Anthropology and Environment Society, a section of the American Anthropological Society. Um, join me in welcoming Dr. Ogden. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction, Donna, and for all you've done to help us uh, have this, bring us all together to have this discussion. And I really uh, appreciate the ICA and the Knight Foundation for supporting today's um, conversation. Uh, what I'm going to do today is talk about, uh, in some ways that overlap with Zach and, and what Jessica has talked about, but some of these pivotal events in the history of the Everglades that help us understand where we are today, um, and by, by which I mean where we are today, a time when we feel like the Everglades is precarious and we feel a bit stalled. But I'm going to do so in a different way. Maybe how Jessica explored water ties, I'm going to explore alligator ties. Um, but more specifically, I'm going to um, use the history of alligator hunting um, in the region as a kind of through line lens to talk about these events. Plus, I thought it would be fun. So on the screen is a landscape called the Bill Ashley Jungles. It's an expanse of coastal forest at the headwaters of the East River within Everglades National Park. Now, the Bill Ashley jungles, like much of the Everglades, is a landscape layered and of layered and complicated histories. If you're lucky enough to visit these islands, you can walk upon the land there that contains the evidence of 4,000 years of human history, people living and dying in a landscape where land and water mix and mingle. The Bill Ashley Jungles was part of what I call a hunter's landscape, a region that white settlers uh, to, this, to South Florida loved for its remoteness and loved as a place to hunt alligators. So I'm going to begin with the Bill Ashley Jungles here, um, talk about the Bill Ashley Jungles a little bit, and then I'm going to return again to the Bill Ashley Jungles at the end of the talk. The Bill Ashley Jungles, that landscape, was named for a gang of outlaws who robbed banks, killed policemen, made and sold illegal liquor during the 1920s. John Ashley, who's on that screen with that kind of rakish eye patch, um, led one of Florida's most notorious band of outlaws, which the press sort of treated like an Everglades version of Bonnie and Clyde. They covered the national press, the local press covered the Ashley gang extensively. And the reason they compared them to Bonnie and Clyde was because John Ashley's girlfriend, a woman named Laura Uptogrove, often accompanied the gang on their various criminal exploits, as well as spent time in the backcountry. Now, the most famous thing about the Ashley gang, probably, is that they were able to evade capture for years. The gang taunted the police at every turn, and when they were incarcerated, they repeatedly escaped from jail and prison. It was like a bad television show, like these always these like kind of 1920s break out of jail things. It would, but, but to bring it back to the Bill Ashley jungles, it was their intimate knowledge of the mangrove swamps that helped them with their successful evasion of the law, at least until John Ashley was shot one dark evening on a lonely bridge near Fort Pierce at a police ambush. The next day, the police laid their bodies out um, in front of the hardware store in Fort Pierce for the press and everyone to see. Laura Uptogrove, the girlfriend, never lived down her unseemly association with this gang and died years later after drinking a bottle of Lysol where, when she was working at a grocery store in a small town along Lake Okeechobee. 
Now, I learned about that Bill Ashley, the Ashley Gang and the Bill Ashley Jungles from Glenn Simmons, who's on the left there. Um, and he was a man who was very much like a grandfather to me. Um, as I said, he's standing on the left there in that photograph, and he's ne standing next to a man named Fishhook Carter. Now, the men are standing uh, on the front porch amid a, a piles and piles of alligator hides that are all rolled up and ready to be sold to a hide buyer. In my lifetime, Glenn was recognized as an expert on the Everglades. He served for, as a guide for most of the scientists and archaeologists who ever worked in Everglades National Park. He started doing this in the 1950s. Um, my first job was as a folklorist in Florida. And um, Glenn, who I loved dearly, really, really wanted to write his own story about the Everglades, his own history of the Everglades, his own experience of the Everglades. But he certainly wasn't a writing kind of person. Uh, like a lot of people who grew up in the early 1920s in Florida, he'd only gone to a couple years of formal school. So I began interviewing Glenn about his experiences um, and trying to capture his version of the Everglades. And in my interviews with Glenn, which I spent about a year doing, he introduced me to the landscape and culture of the white rural poor who lived in the Everglades, many whose families had moved into southern Florida after the Civil War and who supported themselves hunting, fishing, and gardening. In my first book, um, I coined the term gladesman to describe the, cul the culture or a way of marking this, the kind of centrality of the Everglades landscape to the identity, politics, um, and subsistence, really, of white rural people living kind of on the margins and communities of, of, of the Everglades. And I also did this in a way to really acknowledge the gendered nature of these entanglements. Now, one of the big surprises to me when I was working on this book with Glenn so many years ago, I was only 25 years old at the time, was that Glenn had spent much of his life as a commercial alligator hunter. Now, I can't even tell you how shocked and surprised we all were with this. Like, I had literally spent most of my summers sleeping on their porch and hanging out with them. They paid for my first car. They helped send me to college. And I did not know this, and no one in the town knew this, that were contemporary. And uh, literally, we all thought Glenn was a farmer who lived um, in a farm right near Robert is here fruit stand, which he did. Um, now, the reason for this silence, though, was that alligator hunting was illegal in Florida and had been illegal since the 1930s. But as it turns out, alligator hunter, hunting was the main economic activity for many rural households in the Everglades for white, for Seminole Miccosukee people. Um, and almost every household, poorer household, had a few hides sort of rolled up, stashed away, and ready for a hide buyer to come by, like they're doing here on the screen. The stories Glenn told me transformed the Everglades into a landscape where anonymous looking tree islands became sites reverberating with the working class history, with community and livelihoods predicated on hunting alligators. Our work was the first to document this history, and it was an important intervention into the politics of the National Park Service, which tends to romanticize nature at the expense of the messy and complicated histories of the lands they acquire as Jessica pointed out. <laughs> After finishing this book, I continued this research by conducting fieldwork in communities throughout the greater Everglades, interviewing alligator hunters, fishermen, and others to further understand what I thought of as an ex a forgotten experience and sense of place. So on the screen there, for example, this is a guy uh, hunting alligators at the turn of the last century using basically a hook to drag an alligator out of a, a, an alligator hole. Spending about a decade doing field work with alligator hunters helped me to understand that the categories of human and non-human obscure an awful lot about the complicated ways other species make us who we are. Let me talk about alligators and alligator hunting just for a moment to demonstrate this. As all of you know, alligators are extremely powerful creatures that weigh hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. 
They create the Everglades landscape. They hollow out these holes where they live, especially, and, and they, which fill up with water during the dry season and attract um, birds and fish and deer to them, and they sure as heck attract alligator hunters in the winter. Alligator hunters spend an awful lot of time at these alligator holes trying to get alligators to come out of their dens. So the walls of these alligator holes, they're, they're, it's, there's muck and mud, and alligators burrow out into the sides, um, and they can stay underwater, therefore, for like 10, 12 hours at a time. So luring alligators out of their holes was one of the most important things that hunters did. It was a transformative process where hunters became, or nearly so, alligators. Becoming alligators, in part, in part, is acoustic. To get an alligator to come out, hunters would imitate the sounds of baby alligators make, because alligators, just like tired mothers like myself at times, would like to eat their own. Now, the surest way to get an alligator out, as I said, is to make this baby th noise, this grunting noise. And it begins like a soft sound in the back of the throat that then kind of comes out and reverberates in a noise that's soft and ends in silence. Soft and low alligator grunting is a gentle reverberation that forges a territorial connection between the animal and the human worlds. Skinning alligators, as you can imagine, is physically taxing and repetitive. Walking after hours of of, after a few, waking after a few hours of sleep, hunters often skinned several dozen alligators at a time. Many of these animals weighed hundreds of pounds. The hunter's landscape, to be graphic, is one of bare hands and feet immersed in the flesh of alligators of speaking with alligators, thinking like an alligator, smelling like an alligator, and covering oneself in the blood and mess of an alligator. Glades hunters traveled through and across the Everglades upon established routes that were like intersection, intersecting passageways in the backcountry. They would cover um, miles a day in these little narrow boats, similar to uh, Seminole Miccosukee dugout canoes, but made out of uh, plywood often with a flat bottom that were poled. The routes these hunters used were hardly arbitrary. Instead, hunters poled their boats through established passageways that formed tunnel through the mangrove jungles and staked, snaked across the inland marshes. In some ways, these passageways were like a watery system of routes, similar to the, the roads in every one of our neighborhoods. Though to outsiders, including game wardens, these routes remained largely invisible and unnoticed. This invisibility was important for people like John Ashley, who hid out for years in the backcountry, but also this invisibility was important for regular hunters because the most lucrative economic activity alligator the alligator hide trade was, of course, illegal. This means that hunting was a form of poaching, making people, regular people, outlaws too. Hunters lived their lives in secrecy, finding ways to hide alligator hides in their hidden compartments of their cars, traveling um, at only at night, never using the lights on their cars when they were trying to take hides somewhere to sell them and also seeking out the most remote places in the backcountry Everglades, like the Bill Ashley jungles, to hunt and camp. Didn't you like this picture? Because there's like a puppy in it. <laughs> Glenn gave me that photograph, and this is one of his skiffs, and uh, he would carry a puppy with him. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> of course, alligators will eat a puppy in a New York second. Um, for my second book that is called Swamp Life, I, I uh, worked with a lovely uh, photographer who's from Miami, Deborah Mitchell. Some of you all may know her um, for the photographs in the book, and she really got my sense of using photography in ways that did not illustrate as much as evoke things, feelings. I've spent time talking about the, this hunter's landscape with you, hoping to help you feel it a little bit. Um, as a way of setting up the political question, which is, why was hunting illegal? Conservation agencies in Florida believed overhunting was causing alligator populations in Florida to be threatened with extinction. 
So beginning in the 1920s, individual counties began to restrict hunting. Then in the 1930s, the state of Florida passed laws further restricting alligator hunting, though these restrictions were nearly impossible to enforce. Yet by the 1960s, it became clear that alligator hunting was decimating alligator populations within Everglades National Park and a few other places. The Miami Herald, for example, um, at the time in the early 1960s, reported on illegal alligator hunts happening in, in, within Everglades National Park that e just during one night, people, they would find thousands and thousands of skinned alligators laying rotting along backcountry lakes. So in response in 1968, the American alligator was listed on the federal endangered species list, making the sale and interstate commerce of hides absolutely a federal crime. This stopped hunting, period, <laughs> because before that, hunters would just simply ship their hides to Louisiana and sell them because state law didn't work that way. But after that, it stopped, pretty much. The question I have, of course, is, was hunting the problem? Certainly, after alligator hunting was made f a federal crime, the populations of alligators rebounded. Um, they were delisted quite soon afterwards, like around 19, in the early 1980s. But the question I have, the political question, is was hunting the problem? Most likely the answer is yes or no, which of course is the answer that any anthropologist will give you because they'll always say it's more complicated. Um, here I'm going to say it's more complicated, but maybe less so than you might think. While overhunting was a problem, the real problem was the rapid transformation of the Everglades landscape and thus the eradication of much of alligator habitat in about two-thirds of the historic <laughs> Everglades system. We know, for example, that in the 1920s, alligator, alligators were plentiful, as this image illustrates. This is actually uh, a dredge used to build the Tamiami Trail, um, which took about 13 years to complete in the 1920s. Um, but the guy on the top is a marksman watching out so that the men who are working on this dredge were not attacked by alligators. So what happened? I'm going to return to the Bill Ashley, um, to the John Ashley gang, um, to sort of act like there's some kind of threat to this talk. <laughs> John Ashley's father, the father of the gang, his name was Joe, moved his family to Florida to work as a woodcutter on the Henry Flagler's East Coast Railway. Rail, 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 rail. This, of course, is the ar artery that opened up Southern Florida to real estate and agricultural development in the late 19, in 1890s. As I said, this railway was critical into Flagler's Florida empire, and, 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 um, and what he did was he retired. He, Flagler basically moved to Florida after he retired from Standard Oil, which he um, co-founded. Um, and aside from the railway, uh, Flagler's interest included several lavish resort hotels, the Breakers, the most famous one in Palm Beach, but as well as an agricultural and real estate development company. Now, as do all empires, Florida, uh, Flagler's required an enormous amount of cheap labor and cheap resources, um, including people like the Ashley family, which is why they came. Now, not long after Flagler's railway makes it down to Miami, um, it enables a kind of intensification of drainage to occur in, um, in the agricultural areas or the, dream, the hope, hope for agricultural areas at the time around Lake Okeechobee. Cheap labor was also very important to the dredges that dug the primary drainage canals in southern Florida such as the North New River Canal Project, which is an image right there, is a dredge for the North New River Canal. It took six years to build um, the can this canal that ultimately linked Lake Okeechobee to the Atlantic Ocean at Fort Lauderdale. The North New River Canal Project was the first of several canal projects, as we all know, initiated by what was called at the time the Everglades Drainage District, which was a massive state-sponsored swampland rec reclamation effort designed to spur agriculture in the region. Let me, though, say the noise working on these dredges was excruciating. When you talk to people who worked on those dredges, as I did, 
um, they would tell you about how their ears would bleed from the sound. Now, a dredge on the North Fork of the, New, the North, North New River is also important to the Ashley Gang story. It's critical. In 1911, this is his first crime, or bad crime, John Ashley was hunting otter and alligators with a group of Seminole hunters near Fort Lauderdale. He and DeSoto's Tiger, who was a very important son of Mary and Tom Tiger, uh, and Tom Tiger was a respected leader, left the group headed for a dredge operator named C Captain Fowlery. Captain Fowlery was, was close to Tiger and often stored his hides for him when, the, when, the, when they were off, when they, went back to, when they went back home to the Big Cypress, when Tiger was ready to sell them. But, but DeSoto Tiger and John Ashley never arrived at the dredge. They left in their canoes filled with a Winchester rifle and a bunch of hides, and they never arrived. Um, DeSoto Tiger's family was really concerned. He had a new baby at home, and they went looking for him. They took their canoes all the way around to Miami, um, landing at another one of Flagler's hotels to see if they could locate what had happened. What they found out that John Ashley had already been there and left and had sold the otter hides for $1,200 at the Gertman Brothers trading store. Several late years, days later, um, DeSoto T uh, Tiger's body was pulled up by another dredge in the canal. I told that story about John Ashley and DeSoto Tigers and the dredges to remind that transforming the Everglades landscape was enabled by cheap and expendable labor. It was enabled by very unlikely alliances. And also, it was enabled by lots of violence to both people and wildlife. Um, and this is something we should not forget when we talk about this process. The partially drained Everglades was also an unsafe place to live. Early drainage and water management features lured an increasing number of people, poor people from Georgia, from Alabama, from Mississippi, um, down into the glades, black worker, African-American workers, um, as well as poor whites coming down into the glades to farm around Lake Okeechobee. Um, and this was a landscape enormously vulnerable to weather as it is today. For instance, two hurricanes hit uh, South Florida in the mid-1920s. The first one destroyed 13,000 homes and farms in Palm Beach County, leaving 400 dead. Then two years later, an earthen dike that they built around the southern edge of the, of the lake um, gave way when another hurricane hit. Um, people describe this um, hurricane winds coming across like a wall creating, coming across, hitting that earthen dike that just couldn't hold. And because it sort of stalled at the dike, the water created a kind of wall that rose up, le leaving Lake Okeechobee empty. And the water um, landed on the town, mainly of Belle Glade, but in other communities too, um, leaving over 2,000 people dead, many of them African-American farm labor. This hurricane was so famously and accurately depicted by anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston in her fantastic and really lovely written book, Their Eyes Were Watching God. But this event, as we like weave our way through, this event may have been the key event in the history of South Florida that brought us to where we are today. Um, it catalyzed the building of the Hoover Dyke around Lake Okeechobee which was mainly finished in, in 1938, although of course they kept working on it until last year and they do keep working on it. Yet the dike did not prevent massive flooding. During the 1940s, a series of devastating floods threatened the economy of South Florida, as the following images show, with, and their captions highlight these economic concerns. This one says, Broward County, where some of South Florida's most valuable orange groves are located, these fine trees died due to floods. Does any, can anyone see what that says? The highly erased track, and it says, a wet track and no customers. That wouldn't be a fun day at the track, would it? Um, here's one in Collier County. This is the most f famous of a series of photographs that documented these, these, these um, 
this, these flood events. Um, this one is in Collier County, and of course it's some cattle um, uh, in flooded out, and, and much, of, much of the cattle population was killed because of this flooded hoof rot. That cattle image <laughs> led to this extremely famous a, a report, which may actually have been, next to the 1928 hurricane, the second most important ca catalyst of where we are today. This is a report that's been called the Crying Cow Report, but it, it, um, it documented those the economic cost and widespread cost over five counties um, to agriculture uh, and to neighborhoods, all the way down into Miami from these events. So this, this report comes out in 1947, the same year Everglades National Park was established. The Florida Everglades Drainage District releases this cat crying cow report, and it catalyzes the federal government to authorize the Central and Southern Florida Project. Of, as we know, we've talked about this morning, the CNSF project was designed to provide flood protection when needed to people and agricultural lands in South Florida and water supply for the rest of us. Many folks say that the Water Management District illustration of the crying cow really was this kind of pivotal moment. Um, we know that, that, that these events, right, are more complicated than, than that. But, they, but I wanted to tell these stories because they're complicated, but they're complicated in the very kind of day-to-day -day lives of regular people who are living in these communities. And it's, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of that. Attempts to make living and farming in the region safe led to the creation, of course, to a new landscape. Much of the least altered aspects um, of the Everglades are now fragmented and diminished. And the, and the places that are the least altered are, are places, became places like Everglades National Park. Um, of course, this is the historic Everglades uh, at one point in time, not 4,000 years ago. Um, but that slough and ridge, the ridge and slough area, alligators were all throughout that region. They were often in the finger glades that sort of reach across like fingers the Miami Ridge from the coast. Alligator hunters used to hunt alligators right, uh, right in Coconut Grove in those finger glades. Um, and then to, but by the, time, uh, the, by the time 1947, by the time the park is established, the only place people could hunt and where alligators could be found were in these sort of remnant glades that are now in protected areas. So, so this, this project to make the place safe also is a project of, of, of putting wildlife in really small pockets in remote areas um, of the landscape. And this is, of course, why alligator populations <laughs> became, um, became, just like alligator holes, hunters went where alligators were, in this case, in the, in the park. So as I, just to summarize this slide here, concerns about alligator populations and hunting correspond decade by decade with this process of, of compartmentalization that transformed more and more of the Everglades into an agricultural and urban development. In fact, by the early 1960s, when the Miami Herald is, is publishing these articles about overhunting in the Everglades National Park, Alligators are living in sort of a, are living. Alligators are sort of living as remnant populations in the southernmost extent of their range. Now, all the attempts to fix the problems of living in the Everglades uh, end up harming Everglades wildlife, including alligators, and sometimes penalizing communities whose labor is built into, but invisible into, the making of this very infrastructure. This is my last slide, bringing it back to the Bill Ashley jungles. I grew up in Everglades National Park, where both my parents worked, an experience that shaped and continues to shape my understanding and appreciation of that ecosystem. In the picture there, that's my mother in the middle. She's wearing a mini skirt uh, while leading a tour through the Everglades um, in a hardwood hammock in the Bill Ashley jungles. I'm the blonde kid staring up at her. I'm wearing a dress and clutching a purse over my shoulder. I want to just tell you all, in the 1970s, people did not wear outdoor gear. You just wore what you wore. <laughs> just remember that when you're spending really expensive things. 
Um, for me, though, the Everglades has always been a mediated landscape, by which I mean a landscape seen and experienced through the different historical and situated forms of knowledge. I grew up literally accompanying my mother as she led interpretive to tours in the Everglades for tourists, listening to what tourists say about the Everglades, to those kind of shrieks when their feet hit the mud. Now, her version of the Everglades was that of a feminist single mother who was obsessed with botany and native plants. This was my Everglades, too, and it still kind of is. But what I hope I've shown today, that the Everglades is also a landscape of layered histories and that there is a politics to the ways these stories are told. Thank you. kind of a weird question for all three speakers, and it's semantics, which I love. Um, and I know Michael Grunwald has written the book called The Swamp. My understanding is that the Everglades is a wetland of moving water. So why do you all call it a swamp? A swamp is not moving water, I thought. And there's lots of parts of the Everglades that move and don't move, so <laughs> I think. I used to use the word swamp because I love this word. I mean, it is a word that really, for me, I'm not, a, I'm not an ecologist, and I want to be, I'm, you know, I, would, I'm, I don't want to be an ecologist, but um, uh, for me, the, the term swamp um, is a, a word that people use a lot. I find, though, that it, it has really negative connotations and scary connotations. It does, doesn't it? And that's another reason I like to use it. But um, it, it has a kind of 19th century connotation, right? Um, and, it, and, and there's certainly, as you say, a lot of work done on kind of unpacking this word swamp, what it means, how it enabled drainage, how it enabled particular kinds of imaginaries about places in the world and what they were valued for and not valued for. Um, people I work with use the word swamp, um, and I also use it as a way of playing with both, both the, what it can evoke, and then in my own writing, writing against that, right? And so I think uh, in my own writing, in my own work, I've played with that kind of tension. Um, swamp is this kind of entanglement. Um, it has these feelings that are tough. And it, but, but we can write against it in ways, I think, that are interesting and productive. Thank you for your uh, speech, your talk. Um, um, I don't know how, what uh, exactly to ask you, but I was just, I'm an artist, and I was impacted by that cow report, the, the, yeah. the, the painting. Mm -hmm. I saw the uh, church, uh, the artist is George Warren, I believe. Um, on, on my phone, I just researched this, this uh -huh. Warren um, okay. Church the, yeah. the, in uh, painting in 1947. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the report. Yeah, and then this report is published in, 19, in 2019? No, no. The oh. Crying Cow report came out in 1947, and those images that I showed before the report were published in the newspapers, published widely. Wi widely. Um, and then the but they had a lot of images that really catalyzed public concern. There was something about seeing these, this cattle underwater that became the image. <laughs> and yeah. so I think that's why it's, it's the image on the report. Yeah. yeah, as an artist, I use the cow as uh, a uh -huh. horse as a symbol. I, I live in Peru, and I saw um, a landscape, also marshland, and some horses living in this area. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. It's just my first time I see, um, think about cows in 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 this uh, Everglades. I don't know. If yeah. You know anything about the impact on this? I mean, this is not their habitat. Um, also, I wanted to share with you that visiting the Everglades in the Homestead, um, mm -hmm. in where the sweet water. Uh, uh, joins with the salty water. Mm -hmm. I was m almost uh, eaten by a cocodrile. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know if you know anything about cocodrile. Um, <laughs> I think they might have be living there, but I don't yeah. know. Cows are not supposed to live in this. Uh, uh, cows have been in Florida for a long time. Huh? The cows have been in Florida for a long time. I mean, I don't know. You know, they're not native to the West either. So, uh, but uh, and they've been they've been in Florida for a long time. People have been raising cattle. Uh, uh, in the northern extent of the Everglades uh, since maybe the mid-1800s, Jessica? I mean, maybe even earlier. 
Yeah, and, um, and so they, they have been a part of that landscape and certainly a part of communities in that landscape. There's rodeos up there. There's, there's one of the best rodeos I've ever been to, the Seminole Rodeos. <laughs> um, but, and so, and, but in terms of crocodiles, yes, there are crocodiles in South Florida. In addition to alligators, they live in salt water usually, though, um, and they are, we don't see them as much. Um, so it's not a problem, isn't it, for, not a for problem. the population? Not a pro I don't think it's a problem. Now, I, you know, I would be more worried about alligators than crocodiles. Crocodiles tend to be quite shy. Hello, hello. I love this image. I love archives. I love that she's in a mini skirt, straight up. Like, <laughs> that's how we should all go if it wasn't for mosquitoes. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to know if we are looking at the same trajectory now with pythons. Um, in the Everglades. Um, I mean, they've now become, it's become a big business. There are guided tours where they take people who have never even seen a snake in their life out there to go pick them up, and they're giving them almost like $2,000 or $3,000 to catch these. So are we looking at that same trajectory? And my second I question... I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my second question is, you mentioned that... Um, I think it was with uh, John. Um, oh Ashley? Yes, when they were taking the hides to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, what was that connectivity and exchange? Because I find that a lot of times our ecosystem in the Everglades is very much like the bayou. Um, and they're yeah. almost like cousins of exactly. ours. Exactly. In lots of ways, I, I would say, absolutely. Um, and this is, the, so thank you on many levels. I also would love that picture of my mom and it makes me so happy to see her at that age um, in the Everglades. Um, but the, the reason, as I said, the reason people, people hunted alligators in very similar ways in Louisiana, um, in Alabama, in, in these wetlands, uh, swamps I would call them, Okefenokee, um, throughout, throughout the South, South Carolina, uh, and very similar methods. Um, and I could talk more about that, but um, and but but they all, may, very few people I ever talked to who were who were alligator hunters in the backcountry ate alligator meat, um, and instead they sold the hides on a nash on a in a uh, they tanned the hide they sold the hides lightly tanned them in the field and then um, would sell them to big tanneries and the leather was all mostly sent to Europe. For a very, it's an ext, you know, alligator hide was an extremely lucrative business. It was kind of the only cash economy for many communities, only cash economy at all. Um, and so when hunting became illegal and harder in Florida, you wouldn't want to be caught with the hides. People would ship them to nearby states where they could sell them and where big tanneries were. So it became this kind of interstate trade. Mm hmm. Hi, my question um, is about writing and the creative process. So you're super accomplished as a scientist and you have a writing style that's very literary. And um, I was wondering if you could talk about your creative process and some of your influences as a writer. Mm. Um, I am interested, thank you, Christy, for that question and the kind uh, remarks about my writing. Um, I have, through the course of my career, been more and more interested in trying to experiment with ways of writing that evoke landscape and evoke a kind of politics of place in ways that make people feel and not just think about a problem. Um, and so I've been experimenting in that way with, I would say, kind of affective ways of writing to do that. I have this little tagline, I say, write to make people feel the world. Um, and, and I've learned a lot from, from anthropologists, but also fiction writers who do that. Uh, one of my favorite anthropologists is a woman named Katie Stewart, who, who is a beautiful writer. Any influence, in, influence on um, a visual artist that you might maybe connect to? Yeah, I mean, um, so <laughs> that's very, that's, it's funny that you asked that question. Yeah. So um, as a writer, I use a lot of visual materials, period. I always have. Like, I take a lot of photographs, so they help me write. 
um, and help me with my field notes. But on top of that, I have been uh, collaborating with Christine Camila right in front of you for a very, very long time, um, who, are, who are artists and um, who bring a performance to their practice as well, and curators, to help me um, think less about writing and much more about thinking and about theory um, and about how to make concepts come alive. Um, and so my, the place um, art has been for me in my own practice has been less about as a writer and much more as a, as a thinker, um, which I'm very, very pleased with, uh, to, to see how concepts move from, from art and art theory into me thinking about how it helps me think about the world. I, I just want to... Because I, I love the introduction, and I I, I felt that as uh, I connection with with your the way you're talking. It, it was um, some way, yeah. <laughs> uh, I felt it. I felt it as an artist, and I I think it's a better way to in, um, it's, a, it's a way to talk about other uh, hard topics, and 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 I I felt I felt that bridge. I felt that connection, and I really. Appreciate that. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you. I was wondering about like the current state of like legality of alligator hunting, and also because um, in like my like research for painting, like one of the sort of image archives that I've come across is bikini bow hunting, which feels like a, a very gendered like relationship to hunting alligators in particular, which is like one of the <laughs> creatures that they do hunt, and I was wondering if you Indeed. came across the imagery or the people who do this and kind of like what, what is like the regulation now? For a while I knew that information, I really don't now. I mean, certainly there are people apply for, um, go, go into a lottery, but I don't actually remember at all how that is orchestrated. But um, in Florida, because there's an abundance of alligators in lots of places, there is kind of a lottery, and it's very highly regulated, it's, and it's expensive. Um, uh, to, to hunt and alligators, but I, don't, I couldn't tell you anything more I used to know, but sometimes information just leaves me, and it, that has. <laughs> Have you seen like that imagery? Huh? Have you seen that imagery? I've seen a little bit of that imagery, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so much you should do with that. <laughs> I'm going to give that to you. <laughs> Laura, could you say a little bit about what you're working on now or into the future? Uh, the work Just out of curiosity and a teaser, maybe? Um, yeah, I mean, I would be, I'd be happy to. So I just had been working for the last 10 years <laughs> in a, on a project in Tierra del Fuego, um, uh, in part with Christy and Camila. Um, and that book just came out. It's called Loss and Wonder at the World's End, but it's a book that is trying to think through the relationship of environmental change and colonialism in the region. Um, um, and now I'm working on a new project that I just started the last few years that's, that's about trying to understand um, the ethics of saving species that are going extinct, I would say, um, and what it means to work as a scientist with species that are going extinct, and the project is, sort of, is about the California condor, saving the California condor. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.